Well, thank you very much. I hope my voice uh, holds out and you can hear me okay. I must say, contraception and HIV, there's probably sort of three of us in the room here, Tim Farley, Ward Cates, and me, who've been on this topic for a long time. So it's not too exciting to sound to, on the sound of things. But actually, Woody Allen said, love is the answer, but while you're waiting for the answer, sex raises some pretty good questions. <laughs> and contraception is currently raising some really good questions that I'm going to walk you into. So I'm going to look at the context and then talk a bit about good old barrier methods, but I'm really going to focus more on the WHO's medical eligibility criteria and how it's applied to the whole issue of contraception and HIV and the implications of recent discussions there. I want to just make a very serious point at the beginning because we're still hearing reports of women being forcibly sterilized because of their HIV status. And I just want to remind us that issues of reproductive health are women's rights. And in this case, the right to decide whether or not to become pregnant uh, for, is, is a woman's right irrespective of her HIV status. And she must be able to choose voluntarily about the method that she wants to, to use. So going back to basics, I think that next to immunization and things like safe water, contraception is one of our biggest public health tools. If you look at this graph here, you can see that Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia still have extremely high maternal mortalities, although it's come down over time. But we know that by 2008, about 40% of global deaths have been averted in terms of maternal deaths because of contraception. The numbers are staggering. Uh, as we sit here now, 150 million women are using hormonal contraception, both combined or orals and Depo-Provera in particular, DMPA. What the good news is, is that the demand for contraception is increasing. And if we look at all the regions, you can see that the demand has gone up, including here in sub-Saharan Africa, where you can see the demand has gone up and that the met need is also increasing. But you can still see that there's a massive unmet need. We should also remind ourselves that things are not static. And these two uh, charts show between 1986 and 1989 and 2002 and 2005 reasons why women were not using contraception. And what's interesting about this is that if you can see the predominance here in blue was it was lack of knowledge. What's happening now is that women are much more concerned about health side effects. And also there's a growing opposition to contraception in some quarters. In terms of the method mix, it varies from region to region, and this is important when we come to the, the bulk of the talk, which is on hormonal contraception in HIV. In the areas such as sub-Saharan Africa, where we have the epicenter of the HIV epidemic, but also you can see in Asia, but you can see that, that, that for example, in sub-Saharan Africa, injectables and pills are the predominant method mix that's used amongst married women. If we look a little bit further in six African countries and we compare unmarried women to married women, what is encouraging uh, is that you can see that unmarried women in all of these countries are much more likely to be using condoms as their contraceptive method. Moving on to HIV, a familiar slide. This is adult female HIV prevalence with this familiar focus here in sub-Saharan Africa. And we know that we all talk about integrating contraception with the HIV services, but we quite frankly have not been very good at it. If you look at uh, PMTCT, we've been very good at element three, which is preventing transmission from an HIV infected mother to her infant. But we've really taken very little notice of this issue, which is preventing unintended pregnancies amongst women. A study we did looking at women who are on antiretrovirals assessed what contraception they were using so it was just over 850 women. And what was interesting is while encouragingly to nearly two thirds reported using condoms consistently, uh, only about a quarter reported using what we would call modern methods of contraception here. And in terms of dual method use, only about 15%. And I'll come back to that because remember that we always say to women, use a condom and another method. And yet it's actually very, very difficult to do. So in terms of the considerations of contraception in HIV, what do we have to consider? Well, there are really five categories. For women at risk of HIV, or women, uh, and in many cases, women won't know their status, we've got to think about are there methods that will prevent HIV, or are there methods that increase acquisition? Prevention clearly is barrier methods. For women who are already infected, we have to think about what the impact of a contraception is, a contraceptive is on infectiousness, on disease progression, and increasingly on drug interactions. 
So I'm going to quickly look at barrier methods, and then I'm going to go into the WHO medical eligibility criteria and take you through a story that's unfolded uh, recently. Now, we're all familiar with barrier methods, but it's worth just reminding ourselves about how good or not they are as contraceptives. And this is the male condom. Uh, and we talk about with contraceptives typical use and perfect use. So if perfect use as a contraceptive in terms of pregnancies per 100 women years, it will be about 3% failure. But typical is much more like 14%. HIV incidence from a range of studies varies anything between 80 to 97%. For the female condom, uh, again, about a 5% uh, failure for perfect use, 21% in typical use. And although we don't have the data, we piggybacked it very much onto male condom data. Modeling would suggest that if a woman who had an HIV positive partner used, was having sex twice a week and used the female condom, she could reduce her risk of HIV uh, infection by about 90%. And finally, the diaphragm. Again, perfect use 5%, about 23% pregnancy rates per 100 women years with typical use. And the, the very uh, well-known study that looked at the diaphragm as an RCT was shown that it was not effective in terms of preventing HIV, which was a great disappointment for all of us. The other problem is that the diaphragm, as it's currently used in places like the US, are using nonoxinal 9 as a spermicide, which, as we all know, actually increases women's risk of HIV acquisition. So that would be a problem as well. Now, the female condom, we've just had a very nice anecdote about the female condom. But the female condom uh, has really not been rolled out to any extent. I mean, it's gone up here to 50 million in 2009. But there are many reasons why. The biggest one has been expense. Uh, but there's a lot of folklore about the female condom, that it's too noisy, it's too big, all sorts of stories. And that put women off. But UNFPA is really pushing now the female condom. But we're going to have to have cheaper prototypes and a much more significant delivery if this is going to make any difference. But there are new barrier methods. And I just want to draw attention just to two examples of these. There are many of them. And these are two examples from PASS. This is the new PASS uh, women's condom, which is, uh, has been licensed to a Chinese company, which is currently scaling up for production. It's in regulatory submission. It's looking at a pre-qualification with WHO and UNFPA. And there's already some preparatory work looking at market shaping in both China and South Africa. Uh, and this condom has been widely investigated to be more suitable for women uh, with the lessons learned from the original female condom. The other thing is a, is a more uh, universal diaphragm, and this is the silks diaphragm. The ordinary diaphragm, for those of you who don't know, comes in sizes, a bit like shoes. You have to be fitted. Uh, and, but this is one size fits all. It's, it's got similar contraceptive effectiveness to the traditional diaphragm, but the exciting thing about silks is if we're going towards multipurpose technology, it could be a reservoir to hold an effective microbicide gel in the future. So the question is, we've been pushing dual methods, and how far can we push this? This is looking at women who are on injectables who reported using a condom at last sex. And although you could say, well, you know, it's up to 35%, quite frankly, there's a problem here. We, we, to, if, it doesn't matter if you're in Norway or Swaziland, saying to women on modern methods and use a condom has a, a limitation. And there is a glass ceiling about how much I believe we're going to achieve by telling women to use two products together. We're going to have to think about that. Moving on to WHO's medical eligibility criteria. This is a tool that's been in, going for well more than 10 years now, which looks at medical conditions and rates them and gives a sense of, of how, how appropriate it is to use them or not according to the condition and according to the method. And what it does is it takes the research that's available. It then has expert review. Uh, the evidence is then digested by an expert committee, often fought about, as you'll hear. And then international recommendations are made, which are then supposed to be modified at country level. This is how it works. If you have a condition such, let's take hypertension. So you have hypertension and the combined oral contraceptive. Then you would look at all the evidence and you would, uh, you would give a classification. A one means you, no restriction on use. A two, the benefits generally outweigh the risks, but there may be theoretical risks as well. Three, the risks generally outweigh the benefits, but you can use the method under certain circumstances. And four is it's an unacceptable health risk and should not be used. And just hang on to those classifications because this is where the debate starts to come in.
So using this in the most recent uh, medical eligibility criteria, this is the kind of thing that helps to give us guidance in terms of HIV and contraception. This is looking at acquisition of HIV and the intrauterine device. And so in this plot, what you can see is there's the red line to the left of prospective studies, and to the right of cross-sectional studies. If the box falls above the line where the, where the one is here, then it's harmful, uh, i.e. increases risk of HIV acquisition. If it's below, it's protective. And this will be done together if there's enough data with um, a systematic review. And you can see that in this, that these boxes fall above and below and they cross the line and they're a bit all over the place. And the conclusion is that there's no evidence of increased HIV acquisition amongst IUD users. Similarly, uh, the, the similar, similar activity was done for IUD use in HIV-infected women. And you can see here that uh, the overall comment was this. There's limited evidence. However, there appears to be no increased risk of overall complications or infections, no effect on disease progression. It's not associated with increased risk of transmission, but you need to monitor for pelvic infection. These are the categories that were given for fitting an IUD, continuing with an IUD. And the only real caution, which is the three, was fitting an IUD with someone with a low CD4 count who's not established on antiretroviral. So you can start to see how putting the data together becomes quite a useful tool in the field. And so the IUD, which most of us would have thought wasn't a good idea, appears to be okay when you start to look at this data. Now the current data on, in the current publication on hormonal contraception says that the use of combined oral contraceptives, which are estrogens and progestogens, or uh, DMPA, which is a progestion-only injectable, are both category ones. That means there's no restriction in their use, with the exception of a category two for DMPA because of concerns about bone density in young people. Um, and, and this is for high, women at high risk of HIV, women who are HIV infected, or AIDS. But Latest newer evidence has made some changes. One of the issues that's, that's changed is our increasing understanding of drug interaction. And so in this chart, which is in the, in, the, in the MEC, you can see that they look at the different categories of ARVs, and they look at the different categories of contraceptions that are available, and they classify them according to the available data about drug interaction. So you can see that for protease inhibitors, it's, it's better not to use, for example, a combined oral contraceptive in this instance. Um, and, and these become very useful tools in the field. Now, all was well until July of last year. And I don't know if Connie's here, but uh, the Partners in Prevention, René Heffron presented a paper at uh, the IS conference in Rome on HIV acquisition and hormonal contraception from the data from the Partners in Prevention, which had nearly 3,800 HIV discordant couples drawn from East and Southern Africa. And this is what was shown. Uh, when she looked at contraception and HIV acquisition from men to women, what she showed with any hormonal contraceptive was a nearly twofold increase in risk of acquisition of HIV, and particularly with injectables, an over twofold increase of, of acquisition of HIV. So, and th this sort of figure of a twofold increase had been found in a couple of earlier studies um, and uh, was always a concern, but other studies had shown no effect. So, the studies prior to this that had shown a, 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 a concern and an increased risk of HIV had been outweighed by the body of evidence that said, no, there isn't. But this was now new evidence. What this study also looked at was contraception and HIV acquisition from women to men. So this is looking at if a woman is HIV infected, what is, the, is there an increased risk with her transmitting to a male partner? And what you can see here, again, is for any hormonal contraceptive, a nearly twofold increased risk, and for injectables, again, a nearly twofold increased risk. And the authors made this conclusion. They said that mounting evidence that hormonal contraceptives, particularly injectable methods, increase a woman's risk of acquiring HIV-1. And they also noted that it would be the first study to demonstrate that hormonal contraceptives increase an HIV-infected woman's risk of transmitting HIV to her partner. So this is quite a profound finding. And, and this is the, if you took those findings at face value, what would it mean? Well, for an HIV-uninfected woman, if she uses DMPA, remember the first one with an over two-fold increase in risk, she has less risk of pregnancy, but she has more risk of HIV acquisition. 
If she stops her DMPA, the question is, does she have many other contraceptive options? And what we're seeing in many places is that the contraceptive method makes her shrunk. And very often, women do not have very large choices. So if she stops this, is there anything else she can use? If, she, if there isn't, she can become pregnant. If she becomes pregnant, there's an increased risk because of pregnancy of HIV acquisition. And there may be an increased risk of morbidity and mortality associated with that pregnancy. And an unwanted pregnancy may produce a worse outcome in terms of infant survival. Now, what about the infected woman who these, this data suggested increased her risk of transmission to her partner? If she uses a hormonal contraception, she's got less risk of pregnancy, but she's more likely to transmit to her partner. And if she stops the method, again, does she have other options? And if she doesn't, she may become pregnant. And if she becomes pregnant, uh, she's got more risk of, uh, she's got risk of transmitting to an infant. Uh, she's got more risk of HIV transmission to a partner as well, more risk of morbidity and mortality for herself. And also unwanted HIV infected infants have much worse outcomes than those babies who are wanted. So, what was the response to this? Uh, so you can see that uh, it, all of this, these were from uh, US and uh, UK and uh, newspapers. HIV could spread if birth control injections increase warn scientists. So it was a very, uh, the media picked up on this and it became very high profile, including being in the New York Times. But it became very high profile also in the countries where there's a very high use of injectables and also where there's high HIV. And this was on the front page of the star in Kenya. Because of this and because of the controversy that then erupted, there was a WHO expert consultation on hormonal contraception in HIV that was asked to look at the medical eligibility criteria again, to grade the evidence and to come out with a new classification or a revised classification if required and a research and programmatic agenda. So the, the, all of the issues were looked at. Um, we looked at acquisition, transmission, and progression. In terms of hormonal contraception and HIV, looking at all the evidence around progression, there was one randomized control trial that had some fundamental problems associated with it in six cohort studies. The data was rated as low overall quality, and there was no change in the recommendation that women who are HIV infected can continue freely to use these methods. In terms of transmission, similarly, there was less data, um, but looking at overall all the data, there was a decision not to change from the category one, i.e. That, that women can continue to use the method. Well, this was where the problem came in. Uh, this was the studies of injectables and HIV acquisition. And again, if you look at this chart, to the right of, of, of the line here is harm, increased acquisition, and to the left is protected. And you can see that in this case, the predominance of the diamonds are lying towards the right of the line, including the heffron data here. Uh, and, and so it looked like, indeed, that there might be harm if you looked at the data in this way. Uh, but there was a systematic review that was presented, and we looked at eight cohort studies. And all of them, because they were observational studies, had serious limitations. But this became the major focus of the meeting. So this was the great debate. <laughs> I know, isn't it great? I love it. OK, so this was the great debate. Uh, that this is all observational data that there was inherent selection bias where you're getting women to choose their contraceptives in these studies, lots of potential for confounding, that in, many of the, in some of the studies it wasn't the primary study endpoint, that hormonal contraception was not always well documented, that self-reported condom use was unreliable, and condom use differed between the non-hormonal and the hormonal arms. These two things in particular became very controversial. So the question was this, if we left it as, an, as a one, as it was currently, no change would imply that the data are not convincing enough to support even theoretical concerns about injectable progestins and HIV acquisition. If we moved it to a two, a change implies that there are theoretical concerns, which is the definition of a two, which still allows use, but if misunderstood, might scare women and jeopardize global use without many alternatives being available. And the other problem we picked up is that DMPA and Aristra, both injectable progestins were, bumped, were dumped into one basket, and yet they looked like, from the basic science perspective, that they were fundamentally different. So the meeting basically divided between these two. 
uh, there were very strong feelings in the House that it should be a one and very strong feelings that it should be a two. And eventually a WHO statement came out in February which uh, gained a lot of attention. And it remained as an MEC category one, and this is how it was worded. So it, the WHO should continue to recommend that there are no restrictions, MEC category one, on the use of any hormonal contraceptive method for women living with HIV or at high risk of HIV. However, the group recommended that a new clarification be added to the MEC for women using progestogen-only injectables at high risk of HIV. And this is the first time that a clarification of this nature had been added in this whole process. And this is what the clarification said. Because of the inconclusive nature of the body of evidence on possible increased risk of HIV acquisition, women using progestogen-only injectable contraception should be strongly advised to also use condoms and other preventive measures. The group further wished to draw the attention of policymakers and program managers to the potential seriousness of the issue and the complex balance of risks and benefits. So now you've read those two things. On the one hand, it's a one. Use it freely, use it freely. On the other hand, it's but, and especially for progestin injectables. So what happened with the news? Well, th this is what happened. Uh, on the one hand, some people said hormonal contraceptives are safe for women, yay. On the other said there's a warning. And, and, and so we got into a confusion uh, because it, it, the two things seemed to be uh, almost in conflict with each other. So what happened then was that uh, some activists and women's organizations and journalists said they couldn't understand a category one with that clarification. What did it mean? Uh, they wanted, people wanted clarity on what do you say to women? I mean, if we're a bit confused, what do you say to women in a clinic about what there is or there isn't a risk? Some researchers said the only way to, to sort this out finally is to do an RCT, and some donors are now thinking about that. But the modelers got involved as well. And one of the major criticisms, if you recall, I said about the data, was that uh, the Heffron data and other observational studies, is, is, but it's about condom misreporting. And the, the idea is that people overreport, particularly on what they're really doing with condoms. But this modeling here, uh, it, to this side of the dotted line, this is less misreporting by injectable hormonal contraceptive users, and this is more misreporting. And this is Jenny Smith's model. And what she, she looked at were different levels of misreporting re between reported injectable hormonal contraceptive users and non-hormonal con injectable hormonal contraceptive users. And she noted that, that depending on the level of misreporting, you can get a, a, a very large um, observed difference. But you have to have a very large difference in misreporting. And even with the largest difference up here, where there's a tenfold misreporting, it didn't, the model didn't reach this level of two. Remember the Heffron data said there was over a, a twofold increase here? Uh, and this, this model showed that even with significant misreporting of condom use, you still didn't reach that level that the Heffron data, and that implied that perhaps there was more to this than, than could be explained away by condoms. The other thing that was looked at was what this would mean at a country level. Because remember the WHO said, think about this carefully if you're a policymaker, it's complex. So this shows HIV prevalence in 15 to 49 year old women, which is the fertile age group. And this shows injectable hormonal contraceptive use. And if you put these two things together, you see this overlap between the use of injectables and HIV prevalence. And look what you see. You see that in sub-Saharan Africa, you've got high HIV prevalence and you've got high injectable hormonal contraception use. So what you've done is, if this is true data, you've got a perfect storm. If it's not true, we don't have to worry about it because we've also got very high maternal mortality here and we really want effective contraceptive methods. So I'm just going to show you a couple of the modeling that they did. They've done a lot of modeling and they're continuing to do this. This is Tim Hallett's group. Um, but what you can see here in this, in red, it's where the odds ratio is just over two, which is similar to the Heffron data. And then the yellow is where it's 1.2, a much lower increased risk of HIV. And they, what they concluded from this is that regions with high HIV incidence and high injectable hormonal contraception use have the most infections attributable to the use of injectable co contraceptives. So here they looked at how many infections have been driven, if there is an increased risk. How many have been driven? And you can see that in countries like South Africa and Kenya and Malawi and Tanzania, in many of the African countries where injectable contraceptive use is high, there's a significant, this is a significant driver. 
But you can't just look at that. You also have to look at maternal mortality. So you've got to weigh up what you might lose if this is the case in terms of increased a HIV infections versus what might happen to increased maternal mortality if you withdraw a product. And what you can see here is that the maximum benefits of stopping hormonal, uh, hormonal contraception is in countries where there's high HIV incidence and low maternal mortality. In countries where you have high maternal mortality and less use of injectable contraception, you're going to get more deaths if you withdraw the product. In countries, again, like South Africa and Kenya, where you've got moderate maternal mortality but high injectable use, you're going to get fewer deaths if you withdraw the product. And there were many more models that were done, but this adds to the complexity. So putting all of that together, what is the current guidance? Well, for HIV uninfected women in a high prevalence situation, male and female condoms, intrauterine devices, yes, combined oral contraceptives, yes, injectable progestins, yes, but there's strong recommendation to also use condoms. And this question about whether net N, which appears to be different, needs more research because it's, it's, it's acceptable to women. There's very little data on many of the new methods, and male and fem female sterilization are acceptable as long as consent is adequately given. In terms of HIV infected, it's the same thing, male and female condoms, but IUDs look like we should be thinking that we can use them, which, which is, is, was, is not intuitive, but it, certainly the data supports it. COCs, yes, but be careful about drug interactions with antiretrovirals. Uh, injectable progestins, a couple with drug interactions as well. And again, not much data on the new methods and male and female sterilization is acceptable. So we've got this menu of what we can still use. However, what does all of this mean at the moment for programs? Well, there was a general consensus from WHO that we should expand the method mix. As I said, the method mix has reduced. What I'm going to show you now is what South Africa is now thinking in the light of this discussion about what it might do in terms of a new contraceptive policy. So we're wanting to expand the method mix and we want to introduce newer long-acting hormonal contraceptions and cautiously phase out Depo-Provera. Depo-Provera, just for those of you who don't know, is a very high dose of hormones that has a lot of side effects. Women tend to put on weight, they get amenorrhea, and there's a prolonged return to fertility that can take up to about nine months. And now you've got this question mark about HIV in high settings. So we want to cautiously phase this out, but we don't want to do it in a hurry. We don't want to frighten women, and we need to have alternatives before we can possibly even think of it. We want to reintroduce intrauterine devices for women who are negative and positive. And we want to look at reintroducing the female condom, uh, or introducing it more widely, and, and we really need these cheaper options. So we would encourage any of those involved in this technology development to look at that. Um, but we also want more barrier methods. So perhaps if silks come in in the future, this is something that could also be thought about. We need better communication strategies to try and explain these very complicated things to women. Uh, how do you explain this data to a woman in the clinic where you're saying, here's your injection, by the way, here's three months' supply of condoms? Um, and we also need to focus on the lowest contraceptive uptake. And we need health systems research because, as I said, the integration of family planning and HIV services has simply not taken place in the way it should. The research agenda that was there suggested that we, we really have to get better epidemiological evidence. What we've got is a conundrum. What we've got is no overall consensus, and we've got a concern, but it's not a concern that's driving us to say DMPA must be withdrawn because of HIV acquisition problems. And when we introduce methods, we also need to think about how can we monitor HIV acquisition particularly, but also transmission and progression. There are a whole number of basic science questions so that we need to understand the biology of these hormones more and understand the biology as they interface with HIV. We need mod more modeling studies, and the models I showed you are very basic models, but now they're looking at much more sophisticated models that will take into account many different variables. And we need new barrier methods, and we need to start moving towards thinking about multipurpose technologies that can prevent against both contraception, HIV, and STIs in any combination. So I'm going to leave you with this last thought. Consider this hypothetical. If millions of men were on a high dose of a first-generation statin, where newer statins with the same efficacy and fewer side effects were available, 
And the higher dose of made men put on weight, made their hair temporarily stop growing. Depo-Provera doesn't do that, it stops your periods, but I was trying to find an analogy. Uh, <laughs> And it took nine months to return to normal and may possibly, we're not sure, increase HIV risk. How long would the marketplace tolerate this? I'd like to thank everyone very much. I'd like to thank all my colleagues, Ward Cates, I don't know if you're in the audience. Thank you very much for your assistance with this. Um, and I hope I've left you with food for thought. Thank you.